Hello and welcome to Straight Talk Africa. I'm Heidi Adams. Thank you for joining me. This week, we'll take an in-depth look at the lives of refugees. According to the United Nations, tens of millions of people worldwide have had to flee their home countries. What happens to communities and countries where people leave due to war, persecution and violence? And what are African nations doing to ensure people can return to their home countries? Also, The Voice of America presents an in-depth look at a day in the life of refugees around the world. All of that and more coming up. Straight Talk Africa starts now. Every day, millions of people are forced to flee their homes because of persecution, conflict, violence, human rights violations and other serious events. According to the United Nations, more than 80 million people are forcibly displaced around the world. 29 million of those people are found across Africa. Some are refugees, some are internally displaced, others asylum seekers and so on. Most of the world's refugees are hosted in these five countries, Turkey, Colombia, Pakistan, Uganda and Germany. This week, we also want to share the personal stories of refugees and other forcibly displaced people, some of whom have turned their own experiences into an opportunity to help others. The odds were against Adieu Achul. Her family was killed in what is now South Sudan when she was just a child. She grew up in Kenya's massive Dadaab refugee camp. Life was hard and Achul worked hard. Today she is an entrepreneur and an activist helping others in the camp where she grew up. Juma Majanga brings us her story from Nairobi. Adiu Achul is making soap at her home base factory in the suburbs east of Nairobi. The hardship of growing up in a refugee camp made a deal want to do something to change the plight of refugees. And after getting trained in soap making, she set up a business. I believe uh, I'm still a refugee and anything I do will always help my community. I'm in a position to be able to help my community. Why will I not help them? Achun works with humanitarian groups like the UN Refugee Agency to distribute soap, face masks, food and other donated items to the most vulnerable and needy families among the refugees as well as the host communities back in the Dab and Kakuma refugee camps. The refugees who approach us with the brilliant idea like uh, Adieu had that they want to help a refugee and also the vulnerable host community, then we, we must support because uh, because the funding for the humanitarian agency unfortunately reducing significantly during the COVID-19 pandemic. Having overcome many odds, Achul is completing her last year of studies for a Bachelor of Commerce degree and runs a mentorship program for refugee girls and young women. I run two mentorship programs, one just to train them on basic entrepreneurial uh, skill. And then the second one is um, about the important and mobilization, anything to do with education specifically. So that when after their childbirth, you, they will choose either to go back to school or to have their own business. Kenya is one of Africa's top refugee hosting countries with over half a million refugees, mainly from the neighboring Somalia and South Sudan. But the government wants to close two camps, which together house more than 400,000 refugees and asylum seekers. Achul is worried about the fate of refugees if the camps close. The UNHCR is urging Kenya to keep them open. We're living in the period that uh, more than 80 million people are displaced over the world. And this is the time that we need a solidarity more than ever. While the refugees await Kenya's final decision, Former refugees like Achul are stepping forward to help the vulnerable in their community during a difficult and uncertain time. Juma Majanga for VOA News, Nairobi. Juma Majanga there with that story for us. Juma, thank you. What happens to communities and countries when their people leave? 
And what are African nations doing to ensure that those who have left can safely return? Earlier, I welcomed back to the show Iskandar Nagash. He is the president and CEO of the U.S. Committee for Refugees and Immigrants. He told me the situation is not getting any better. Overall, you know, according to the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees uh, report, the latest report, I have 91 million, almost 92 million refugees and IDPs globally. Uh, in, in, in Africa, as you know, the total number is a little bit over 29 million. Um, out of that, uh, in West and Central Africa, we have 1.3 million. In East and part of Africa and the Great Lake region, we have about 4.5 million. And in Southern Africa, uh, we have about 720,000 uh, refugees. Uh, but the, the IDP number, the internally di displaced number, that number is much higher. And the West and uh, Central Africa, that number is about 6.3 million. In East Africa, you know, Great Lake is about 9.7 million. Um, in Southern Africa, it's about 6 million. So when you add all the people that, you know, the number is significantly higher. Um, I think most people can relate to and understand this idea that nobody really wants to leave home. Do all refugees necessarily want to return? And what does the environment at home need to be like or look like in order for them to do so? In some places, I think people are very much attached to their homeland. You know, I think they left everything to become a refugee. Um, and, you know, it's not that it's something that they chose to do. Uh, for the rest of their life, but they have chosen that journey. Uh, and then, you know, going back, is again, depend on the condition back home, you know, and they're going to be, again, persecuted. Uh, I know in some places, and, you know, some refugees became, you know, went back home and then became refugee again. The situation changed. Uh, again, we're talking mostly in African uh, perspective, but the situation back home determines was a one decided to return, but some also, once they have uh, settled down and have jobs and have children, uh, then the situation goes a little bit different. You know? uh, but I do know people returning home, uh, trying to build their country. Uh, the South Sudanese, uh, the last boys of South Sudanese who came into the U.S., uh, some of them returned back and often often age, some of them are very becoming successful farmers and business people. It happens, uh, but the number is not that high. I think that the challenge, uh, especially for Africa, is, is, is there is a level of brain drain that, you know, there are probably more doctors uh, and nurses outside Africa than inside Africa. Uh, I mean, that's just uh, part of the challenge uh, that our African countries are facing. Uh, but they have to create a conducive environment either to return or, or have a system where they, nobody should be allowed to uh, be forced to flee, uh, flee their own country uh, because of leadership issues, the political issues, uh, and civil war. Eskander, are receiving countries always working with the understanding that having refugees in their country is a temporary situation? And can refugees ever be forced to return home, even if it isn't necessarily safe for them to do so? I, I believe some refugees voluntarily return, but forcibly return is against uh, the international law. Uh, that, that's something a lot of countries don't want to do, especially if they are signatory to the 1951 Convention. Uh, but having said that, some countries do forcibly uh, return uh, refugees. Uh, that, that happened in different places. Uh, in fact, recently, uh, Djibouti uh, forcibly returned a couple of refugees back to Ethiopia. So it does happen, but for the most part, it's not very common to forcibly return refugees. Yeah, the refugee situation, one assumes, is temporary, but the average refugee stays in refugee camp is about 17 years. 
uh, if you go to, as I mentioned, the Somali refugees, they've been there since 1991. And you have in Africa, the Eritrean refugees since 1968, talking about second generation of refugees. Uh, so that, that's the kind of situation we have in Africa. And the African Union um, doesn't seem to be uh, uh, interested in resolving this, this refugee crisis. You know, it's always so bittersweet, and this happens around the world, we see, when people have to leave home forcibly and then go on to find success elsewhere. And you think to yourself, wow, just imagine what their home country would have gained if only it was stable, it was peaceful, if the country had proper and the right kind of leadership and the environment that allow, would allow people to find success at home. Now, in Africa, what do countries and societies lose when they lose their people? I think, you know, once you lose your people, then you lose the soul of your country, you know. Country is not about it's a mountain, it's about the river. So, you know, the country has become a country because of its people. When you lose your people, it slowly you are actually chipping your, your country. So, the loss is, is, is uh, enormous. You know, Africa has been losing its uh, workforce for many, many years. Uh, it was from slavery and then, you know, this migration issues. Um, so I think, you know, the loss is enormous for Africa, for every aspect of health care, for education, for culture, uh, even for governments, you know. The United States is a good example, you know. It's a country of refugees and immigrants, you know. Uh, here is uh, the U.S. became a most successful country because just ordinary people came to this country and became extraordinary people simply because they have the freedom to choose the freedom to go to school they have the freedom to the, the freedom to open business uh, they have the, the freedom to own property so freedom is the key you know, uh, you know if, 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 if that freedom was given uh, in your own country uh, you know, nobody would leave you know in africa is not a poor continent you know it has national resources um, and, and all kind of human capacity, if you will. Um, but that, unfortunately, you know, we are not learning from, from history. Um, so refugees have never been a burden to another country. In fact, they are, they are the assets, you know, you know whether refugee camps, a uh, doctor from Iraq or Afghanistan or from, from other countries in Africa. They come with experience and expertise, and, and you know they they become a productive member of their society. Um, so Africa loses, and Africa, unfortunately, Africa is losing on a daily basis. Iskander, in terms of what you're seeing, what are African countries and the African Union, for that matter, doing to encourage or entice people who have left? to return, you know, a sort of recruitment drive to give people a reason to come back. Is that needed? And is it happening anywhere or on any level? I, I think, you know, they have to have the, the, the environment, the conducive environment for people to come, you know. I mean, how many uh, people go to Africa? I mean, you know, if you go to Uganda, it's, it's South Africa. You can see it, other people also from other continents coming to, to some countries so because they, they see that there is uh, uh, an environment that they can they can succeed. Uh, so I think, you know, Africans have to make it, you know, conducive for people to return. If you have some people for 30 years and 40 years in power uh, with no constitution, with no you know, proper government, nobody wants to invest there except some countries who don't really care about the people rather than just the resources. So, you know, Africa has to make a decision, you know, is, is this the way we're going to go as, as a continent, as a country? Um, if that's not the case, you know, we'll lose the human capital, that capital and the brain drain will continue. And when that happens, you know, the situation gets from, from 
bad to worse simply because you don't have the people to run it. You know, if you don't have enough doctors, you can't have a hospital. You know, if you, have, you, know, if you don't have a, a system uh, where people have the right to defend themselves for whatever belief they have, if that's not there, you know, again, you know, the migration will continue. Eskinder Nagash is the president and CEO of the U.S. Committee for Refugees and Immigrants. We're going to take a short break here, and when we come back, we'll bring you part one of A Day in the Life of Refugees, a new documentary film produced by The Voice of America. We'll be right back. Health, wellness, sport, beauty, medical breakthroughs. Healthy Living cares about your well-being. What are the main health concerns in Africa and around the world? Find out the latest on coronavirus. Connect with our experts and ask them questions. How long does the virus stay? Join me, Lino Khmudu, in Washington every week on Healthy Living, right here on VOA. Welcome back. Nearly every day there are images on television and social media of people fleeing their countries in search of safety and refuge elsewhere. And behind every image are personal stories of people who face danger and enormous obstacles as they try to survive and find their footing in a foreign place. On World Refugee Day in 2019, the Voice of America sent more than 75 photojournalists around the world to bring you some of those stories. Here now is part one of VOA's A Day in the Life of Refugees. Refugees and the smugglers who try to bring them from Turkey to Greece work most often in the dangerous darkness. Every time we're able to find the migrant boat and help them to safety, it means that we are doing our job. Yesterday we, uh, we had the same team on, uh, on patrol and we are spotted uh, uh, 37 migrants boat with babies and uh, little kids and the uh, elder people. Uh, we were able to uh, uh, intercept the, the boat. We brought them all on board, all the refugees. Then we, we went to Scala's Camini, which is right there. And we took the boat with us where we dropped them off and the Greek Coast Guard took him to the refugee camp in Medellini. It was around this area, so... And tonight we're gonna be around this area as well. They stay on the Greek side of the strait, on hills overlooking the shore. You see a light there? More police with infrared cameras scan the patrol area. They look for changes in temperature that will indicate the presence of a boat or of bodies in the water. The, the moon is almost full. Uh, it's shedding a, a lot of light at the agency, right? So conditions are perfect for either part, for us and for the migrants. So far in 2019, Turkey has intercepted 100,000 refugees seeking shelter in Greece. 18,000 more have made it. It's perfect for everybody. At the same time, they stand out in prayer, looking a little different than the native Indonesians in this mosque. They fled here from Afghanistan because of persecution by the Taliban, but they have not yet found a home. They camp on the streets, but don't attract a lot of attention. Sorry. 
Strangely enough, they want to be on the other side, behind the barbed wire and inside the government detention center. Being in detention would give them access to some services and at least semi-formal status. So far, their decision to leave Afghanistan has been the right one. Nobody here is trying to kill them. The first World Refugee Day celebration was hopeful. This is the time to open our arms and homes in friendship and in support of those who are less fortunate. Five newly arrived refugee families were symbolically welcomed to the United States. At the time, the displaced and refugee population was 19 million. So we have to create a stabler world. On World Refugee Day 2019, the official number of migrants, displaced people, and refugees has grown to more than three times higher. Seven hundred men, mostly Afghans, are being unhappily held here on a landfill surrounded by forests and minefields. Too much problem here. So, no electrics, no toilets, no internet. We are homeless. Today, this 18-year-old will take matters into his own hands. Too much problem for refugees here. On World Refugee Day, he will sneak out to try to get to Italy or Croatia. It is his escape attempt number 22. The most recent was just a week ago. This time, we are five days in the jungle of Croatia. He calls evading the police a game. If you go to Italia, you win. If you catch police, you lose. That is like a game. He will play the game again tonight. Meanwhile, a modest event is being set up to showcase businesses started by refugees. Vendors are in their best clothes because there will be a guest of honor, the man who heads the world's refugee efforts. He will arrive soon. Libya draws refugees hoping to be smuggled across the water to what they think will be safety in Europe. It also draws smugglers and thugs who prey on refugees' desires. It often does not work out well.
فقام الشخص هذا اعطانا لشخص ثاني في بن وليد فبن وليد كمان يعني شفنا فيها العذاب والدق والاشياء كثيره من العذاب كانوا بيعذبونا بالكهرباء وال... يعني اشياء كثير بالضرب والاغتصاب في النساء كمان وضرب الاطفال وكان ما في طعام ولا شرب و... فمنه طلعونا وصلنا طرابلس وطرابلس نزلونا في المدينه علي ما حفظنا قبل بيا من قد اللي بياهم بصح مارينات ميت سني عمد دك هم صاي بصح نارينا عرفنا اللي بيا مزنا اللي بيا مسافنا تاني حرفه ما صب ايره هو مع رموتي يروسي ملو ما حكمنا وصلنا من بقى حما مره مستخاتو وهندي حيل بلا ما نقول ايش ما حكمنا Today, he and his family live at a Red Crescent shelter. They are official asylum seekers, so they have freedom of movement. But the document gives no guarantees pending a final decision on his refugee status. His phone connects them with life back home in Eritrea, but they are just waiting for word. نفس الطريقة الأول جينا بها فالحياة بقت علينا صعبة نحن في ليبيا هنا عاقلين وأطفالنا عايشين في رعب وفي مشاكل فنتمنى هذا ونحن أصلا جينا لحياة نشوف حياة أفضل من اللي كنا عايشين فيها في ريتري في جحيم فحصلنا أتعب منها هلا فالأرزاء الحمد لله زارة ويتهودنا والله Eight thousand kilometers to the east, Mohammed Abu Kalam leaves his office to drive thirty-four kilometers to a series of World Refugee Day events in the world's largest refugee camp. He's the government official in charge of refugee policies in a country strained by the arrival of refugees from Myanmar. More than nine hundred thousand are under his control. We want to see an end to this crisis. Not only here, but globally. We want that the entire globe is free from this kind of problems. Bangladesh is one of the world's least developed countries. In 2019, there is increasing pressure to move resources from refugees to the Bangladeshi people. There may be talk of that at the camp when he arrives. Meanwhile, back in Tripoli, the assignment for this Red Crescent volunteer is to talk refugees out of trying to cross to Europe by sea. As proof, he brings photos of what became of some who tried. يعني ما فيش حتى كرام الميت ما فيش من يدفنك يعني حتى عن بدين بديننا احنا وباسلامنا يعني ما الامر لا يجوز فهمت But the visit is quick. It's not clear if the photos are persuasive. Only 113 kilometers from Africa the closest European island is an attractive destination for migrants. A memorial for tourists shows that many who tried didn't make it. On World Refugee Day, we are sailing into the Mediterranean to meet up with one of two ships that are actively seeking out and rescuing migrants from the sea. The ships are operated by activist groups. There used to be more, but many countries have impounded the ships, saying the do-gooders who run them are only aiding human trafficking. The ship we are seeking is close to Lampedusa, but the Mediterranean is big, and for security, the ship is radio silent.
6,500 kilometers to the east, on this morning of World Refugee Day, a now single mother has plenty to do, but no one to help. Her husband has gone ahead in search of a better life. Now she and her two children wait in the home of her uncle. He fled to Turkey after getting death threats from the Taliban. He was to send for the family, but as of today, he has been gone two years and two months. Unbearable pressure, in fact. She's left alone with memories of her seven-year-old daughter killed in an airstrike. She says her younger son doesn't really know his father. Her worry is about her older boy. More than 9,000 kilometers to the southwest, the school day is starting at one of the world's oldest refugee camps. Refugee kids are taught biology and history by a Somali refugee. But she will only stay until she hears from Canada, where she has applied for a scholarship that would allow her to live and work there. Also this morning, Refugees who fled fighting in the Central African Republic have been brought together for commemoration of World Refugee Day. They hear encouragement from local dignitaries. They also get new t-shirts. Most of the world's 70 million refugees, migrants, and displaced people aren't in camps. They migrate to cities like this one. Just 35 kilometers across the water from Britain, migrants and refugees say they have been targeted. France has a current policy of no fix fixation points um, of migrants or refugees, and they're trying to do everything that they can to try and reduce people from, from staying in northern France. <laughs> The infrastructure to support refugees is in place. Almost 100 volunteers are here to feed all comers. But though there's a sense that there are plenty of resources, it's getting harder for them to actually help the refugees. The harassment techniques used by police forces against, them, against volunteers are many. And though police have driven many migrants out of sight, today we still find officers arresting several on the side of the road as we drive to the tent city called the jungle. 
Calais had a much bigger population of migrants. So you see these few refugees here. Until three years ago when police closed the jungle. They put up fences to block routes to what had been thought of as a safe resting place. So here's the old jungle where 10,000 uh, people used to live. It's all empty now. Everything was evacuated, burned down, uh, gotten rid of right here. Forbidden access. But uh, the irony is that this place is now a resting place for migra migratory birds. So birds have the right to rest, but not human beings. Today, the jungle is rougher. When we arrive, they threaten our crew and stop us from filming. We have to pay one to take some cell phone photos. They complain police raid every two days to move them out. They're holding a press conference this afternoon to air their grievances. We'll have to hurry to make it. Back in Jordan, music signals the arrival of Filippo Grande at the fair. He has been the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees since 2016. In three years, the number of refugees, migrants, and displaced persons has grown from 60 million to nearly 71 million. His job is tough, to mobilize resources to help. He's been brought here to showcase what is possible for refugees to achieve. The refugees are at attention, proud of what they've made. But some booths, he walks by without seeing, caught in conversation with another dignitary. About 1,700 kilometers away, World Refugee Day has started less formally. Adam and his family fled Syria in 2015, gradually moving north. When the border was closed, they were trapped. On World Refugee Day, they're still here. I'm like a lot of refugees who escaped from the war, escaped from the a lot of things. We need uh, to find other future, to find uh, possibility for us, for my family. I thinking about for my family and what I can do for him. We need help to find uh, a good place to find a future. We need somebody to give to give us hand because we lost a lot of things and we are tired. Now we are. I lost my country before nine years or eight years. It's not easy for me. Because of the women and children, today, this camp feels more like a neighborhood. But the barbed wire isn't there to protect them from outsiders. It's to keep them in. In town, just a few kilometers away, a small table and two volunteers quietly mark World Refugee Day. With the camp so close by, Information about those stranded in their country is not new. The bus arrives every morning from U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement Police. It brings undocumented migrants caught trying to cross the border with Mexico. Volunteers at Casa Alitas resettle these migrants. They provide them what they need, including transportation to a new home. Some are pregnant. Their babies will automatically become U.S. citizens. The U.S. is one of only two first world countries that grants unconditional citizenship at birth. On his first day in the U.S., one of those who just arrived is using an alias to explain his decision. Eh, 
y esa fue la intención de venirme para acá por cumplir un sueño, sacar adelante mi familia y salir adelante yo. Seeking a better life is different from being a refugee, but he's well on his way to making the American system work for him. He's been paroled by a U.S. immigration system that by law entitles border crossers to a hearing before deportation. Like the others who arrive today, he'll get clothes, food, and a bus ticket that tonight will take him away from the border and closer to his goal of a job in America. These folks are coming here to, to be part of the culture. They want to be part of America. They want, in a good way, to contribute to it. You know, they know that our country was built on hard work, on um, people of hope and faith who were willing to dedicate their lives to building something greater, and they want to be a part of that. They want to contribute to that. They're simply just asking for security and safety and having us give them the opportunity to, to grow and to take care of themselves and their families. So I have three, three people with children going to the bus. As new ones arrive, other immigrants get ready to leave. Bus tickets take them to places they've never been. Their immigration status is officially questionable. But if they don't commit crimes, they are unlikely to be deported. They will live in places that on World Refugee Day, they're learning about for the first time. Today, Thursday, is World Refugee Day and the United Nations. 3,100 kilometers to the east, Voice of America's Tibetan service readies for its World Refugee Day newscast. Its centerpiece is their interview with the Dalai Lama, perhaps the world's best known refugee. Many problems, you see, due to too much emphasis, the concept of we and they. We are the same human being. When China exiled the Dalai Lama, the Indian government set aside land for Tibetans in exile. Now, more than 70,000 Tibetans live here, including more than 400 monks at the Tashi Lanpo Monastery. On World Refugee Day, Tenzin Kunchuk is trying to get home. He hasn't seen his family since he was seven. He waits for word that the Chinese embassy, 1,800 kilometers away, is willing to see him for a first interview. He expects a no. Uh, I applied uh, seven or eight times. Yeah, I went there it's more than 10 times. Because the Chinese, uh, they don't like Tibetan Buddhist monk. But in exile, he has learned to be patient. Refugees strain resources. Countries like Mexico are caught in the middle. On World Refugee Day, Mexico is asking the United Nations for support. Nuestro país se enfrenta nuevos retos. El número de personas y familias migrantes que solicitan la condición de refugiado en nuestro país ha crecido exponencialmente. No están solos. Eh, les vamos a seguir apoyando de distintas formas para enfrentar los retos de la eh, llegada de refugiados al país. Yet today, police in Mexico are reported to be cracking down on migrants a new development. World Refugee Day is Carolyn Lang's first day as an intern with the U.S. charity Mercy Corps. 
She will work along the Venezuelan border. As that nation collapses under the weight of socialism, Venezuelans are fleeing here to eastern Colombia. Mercy Corps gives them money for resettlement and to help them set up their own small businesses. Gracias, Maribel, para hablar con nosotros. Her job is getting information from those who have been helped. On her first day, she's still getting used to how to explain what she needs, so the team helps out. It's it's really difficult to, to have conversations that are so really intimate with someone. You're asking about um, the money that they're able to spend on um, their family, on food for their family, on shelter, on transportation, all these things that I think lots of people take for granted. It's, it's difficult. It's really difficult. The first person we spoke with was um, sort of much more excited, and she was, um, you know, very proud of, of, of her home and of her family and of what she'd been able to kind of uh, um, create for her family. Um, and then, as you could imagine, the other woman we spoke to was experiencing more challenges and was having a harder time. A tougher time, refugees say, because they're in a new country and longing for home. Yo puedo tener todo aquí, pero en verdad no me siento, en verdad, mi país es mi país. It's a day full of discoveries for this intern. Atiyo mana thore de barmati madal mara mari oyore mura hatat gilam boi mura hatat gilam to hongi gor to hong pura dibele mura mura ajaru suliyore mura mura idde de manche phela dia yire phela dia mane tar ho idde guli mara re duwa. He couldn't leave his son Omar back in Myanmar, and he can't abandon him now. The boy age six is desperately sick from hydrocephalus, swelling from an accumulation of fluids in his brain. A doctor in Cox's Bazaar was to have operated today but the surgery has been delayed. Today, the family must travel back to the Rohingya refugee camp before curfew at dark. It's an uncomfortable trip for the boy A narrow, crowded roads. And a flat tire may mean they won't make it in time. It's Tina Teen's 18th birthday today. She lives with her family in a settlement for internally displaced persons. She and her family fled here in 2008 when Russian troops occupied their home village. It is less than 40 kilometers away, but just a memory. Back at home, her grandmother watches the news. Eleven years later, tensions between Georgia and Russia are still high. At a refugee camp in Africa, 
the cry of twin girls. They were born today. Two more refugees on World Refugee Day. She fled after a failed coup. She now lives with neighbors. But with the babies, there's not enough space. She must move outside. She doesn't know how she will afford her twin babies. One of her biggest wishes for her and the girls, soap. No refugee mother has it easy, and it's tougher if you are alone. This young mother serves others with the help of her daughter. She fled here from Ethiopia. She hopes that one day she'll be able to return. She was widowed in war. She fled across the border. The UNHCR taught her how to make charcoal. Selling it has given her a new life. She misses her home, but having a business has taken her mind off the camp and separation. Back in Jordan, the walk through the craft fair has ended for the UNHCR head. Next, a quick handshake with Amman's mayor, then a regional conference on refugee issues. Prevention means eliminating the causes that force them to flee in the first place. Why don't you look at the root causes and the prevention and try to address that? The flows will go down more quickly than trying to build obstacles to people that, frankly, many of whom are in danger of their lives. Next, on to a visit with UNHCR workers. With 16,000 people on the UNHCR staff, opportunities to brief the boss are scarce. There's a lot to cover, and his day is not over. On the way to today's World Refugee Celebration at the world's largest refugee camp, Mohammed Kalam drives by the registered camp. It was first settled in the late 1970s by Rohingya refugees who were driven from Burma. Nearly 50 years later, a new, larger wave of Rohingya fleeing repression are under his care. He's joined for the ceremony by the U.S. ambassador to Bangladesh. Now we have built a bridge there, supported by Kika, Turkish uh, International Cooperation Agency. Now the, uh, the works are ongoing to link the bridge for a motorized access. But underlying tensions surface, and a refugee march turns into a protest. They chant, no more refugee life. The protesters are quickly moved along, and Kalam is on to his next stop. I'm ready. 13,500 kilometers away, a refugee from China makes a short drive to take his daughter to school. She practices the song she will be singing in class this day. This song has extra poignance. It's titled, God Bless America. After dropping her off, he has work to do on behalf of those he has left behind. More than 3,100 kilometers to the west, Border Patrol Officer George Gomez watches the border wall. 
Uh, this is where we're, we were seeing the majority of the entries coming in, where the smugglers were directing them Here. to come in through, right in between this orange cinder block building and this uh, white wall, this other cinder block wall. Many migrants don't wait for papers. You got anybody else down there? Nah, but we can hit. His job is to stop them. If you come in uh, somewhere where it's not designated as a port of entry, you come in illegally, I have no discretion but to detain you, take you to the station, process you, what have you. But on World Refugee Day, he gets a pleasant surprise. This is something new that we had never seen before. The Mexican government had the National Guard actually out here on foot patrol visible, I guess in an attempt to deter people from actually crossing in here in this, in this sector. A Mexican church has opened its doors to migrants. It's where Haitians waiting to get into the U.S. camp out and wait. Nothing special here marks World Refugee Day, but a sign on the front door indicates that there is a new policy today. It says, owing to the bad conduct of single Haitians, starting June 20th, only families are allowed. Yemi's, 15 years old, wears a Haitian flag as a headscarf. She's been here for more than a month. She's waiting for her number to be called to have an interview with U.S. Immigration. There's no word yet. There's lots of time and little to do. Later, she will be babysitting. <laughs> Meanwhile, she has dreams to share. At the same moment in the U.S., music breaks the morning still. On the porch outside his apartment, Jay Abdo plays mournful music to remind him of home. His life here is very different from his life in Syria. Both better and worse than before. Be sure to join me for the next Straight Talk Africa as we continue our in-depth look at the lives and experiences of people who have had to flee their homes and communities and start over elsewhere. We'll bring you part two of VOA's new documentary, A Day in the Life of Refugees. You do not want to miss that on the next Straight Talk Africa. And we'll post a question about it on social media after we have aired both parts of the documentary. And we'd like to hear what you think the solution should be in Africa and other parts of the world. You can find Straight Talk Africa on Facebook, Twitter, and of course on the VOA News website. From the Straight Talk Africa team, thank you for always watching and always listening. I'll see you next time. Goodbye.